it's kind of hard to just it's kind of hard to imagine looking at the other highly creative arts particularly where the idiom can even bend it's not just you know you, you the the it's not just okay we're working in this idiom and now i'm going to put this spin on it it's more like well yeah, but, I mean, we can all play rock and roll, and I can write my song about the Chevy, and you can write your song about the bridge, and that's great. But you know what? When I play my rock and roll song, people are going to say, wow, he's changing rock. Mm -hmm. He didn't just write another rock song. He did, but he's changing rock. Right. That happens in role-playing all the time, and it has happened in role-playing all the time. It's that kind of creative effort collectively speaking. Under those circumstances, the design conversation is not only inescapable, but in many ways, I can't even see how or what else would you do? What else would you rely on? Particularly remembering that in a design conversation, you are a player. You are working from play. You are experiencing play. You are conducting it. Um, and it's no surprise that the majority of role-playing game designs we see out there are basically somebody who was playing some other published game yeah, and then freaking kicks the tires so much they eventually fell off and they found that they were flapping their arms and making it fly instead. <laughs> so then they wrote yeah. that down. They're like, they wrote a new game. So, and that that is so common that I don't really see... I'm almost tempted... To do the whole sort of you know jazz musician interview thing where the person just leans back and says, just go with it. Just go with it. Just do it. Mm -hmm. Just do it. Go with it. You'll get there. You'll get there. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, as mentoring advice, that is too impenetrable. Right. It just isn't going to inspire somebody to go on. And to an anxious person, it's going to be a brick wall. They yeah. think the person is patronizing them, and they think the person is uh, sure in their heart of hearts that this person is never going to make it mm -hmm. and is just humoring them. Yeah, just keep trying, Sonny. Just keep trying. You know, they're <laughs> thinking to themselves, oh, inside he's thinking, and then I'll go away. Right. But even if that's not what the person's trying to convey by saying that, it's what the listener will often infer if they themselves are uncertain and anxious and, you know, looking for help. Um, usually at that point, the only thing you can do is go back to the inspiration cycle and talk about the fiction that the person wants to see in play and how they want that fiction to change via play. That's the surefire route. That's the surefire route is to say, Go to the re-inspiration cycle, talk about what you go in with before you play on faith alone, that it will develop and your investment will be returned in, you know, tenfold. What is that? What does it look like? And somebody says, yeah, we're, you know, we're the, we're the, we're the rogue beat up spaceship going from junk planet to junk planet or you know out through the the planets that look kind of like the old west or planets full of uh you know uh scary aliens you know don't understand us very well and vice versa and 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 we're just trying to make it through we're trying to get enough goods and profit or whatever to just keep our ship repaired but you know the empire are bastards and they're going to come down on our ass because we don't have the license and you know, we're going to do that. And I'm like, okay, okay. You know, that sounds great. So then what changes fictionally? And sometimes the person has some trouble with that. Yeah. Sometimes they don't, though. And in the particular case that I'm mentioning, it's not too surprising that what they really want is for all the characters, the diverse, suspicious characters, to become fire-forged friends. Hmm. That's what they really want. Right. And they, they want, you know, the the uh, the sort of the turnaround moment where they decide to, you know, stand up against the Empire in some way. Mm -hmm. They want that. Um, however, to many game designers or many role players, to admit that you want that to happen is 
for some reason kind of aversive. Mm-hmm. But you say, would his play successful at all without that? And they would say, no, no, it wouldn't be. Okay. So anyway, you have this this inspiration and re-inspiration cycle. Um, for example, would you, you could say in a game like that, so when the Empire gunship comes down and blasts you all to smithereens, is that a suitable outcome for the ending? And somebody would say, no, no. I mean, we want to feel like that risk is always there. We don't actually want it to happen. That would suck. That would mean that what we really want to see, you know, being dealt with uh, isn't, you know, wouldn't happen. Um, so, uh, so you get an idea of what the person actually wants to be the operations of play that way. Um, it sounds a little abstract, but as I have said many times, as long as you keep that as your guiding star, then those decisions, which can often be very preferential, and I'm not even sure why they have to be anything but when somebody says, like you, I don't want any hit location. Mm-hmm. You know what? This is your first attempt. You know, you're, you, you have a dozen little games in your backpack, my friend, I say to the fellow at the convention. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this yeah. is the first time that you've actually, like, put pencil to paper in front of another human being in this, you know, slightly risky, slightly scary dialogue. So for right now, Let's go ahead and just run with your preference. Don't worry. You don't need hit locations. If you hate them that bad, based on all your experience, and then I'm not even going to talk about legendary lives. It's not my experience that matters here. I'm not trying to give them the broad range of every single option they have. We have to work with what that person at this time feels is a very strong aesthetic and operative standard. And then you say, okay, there's a nugget. And now we can expand from that. That's one of those little micro procedural things. If not hit location, then how do we know what happens when the guy hits you with the sword? And the person say, well, the damage roll will take care of that. That's no problem. And we'll just make it up as is appropriate from the degree of damage. And I'm like, cool. That's what you want to do. We're good. And as long as we know that that's the procedure, who says? GM says, okay, fine. You know, he rolled a four out of six to my leg. Okay, I'm gashed open and I'm bleeding all over the place. Going to be a problem on my next move, isn't it? He goes, right. I said, okay, if that's the procedure, that's how it is. Right. And we're all okay with him picking the leg instead of the arm. Just, he had the ability to do that. He had that part of outcome authority. That You see, the person just said, you roll with some bounce for one aspect of outcome, actually effect. Yeah. And um, yeah, for IE effect, but it's part of the bigger topic of outcome. And for authorities, we talk about, okay, for effect, we've got the die roll and we have the narration of location. Okay, so that becomes part of outcome authority to just say, okay, You see, he's done a whole bunch of technical design with vocabulary, and he doesn't even know it. He doesn't have to know it. Mm -hmm. Only weirdos like you who want to know the vocabulary of, you know, of of all the options. But you see, Mm -hmm. laying out all the options isn't going to help you actually design a game. Mm -hmm. When you help me design a game, I don't sit there with a whole library of options in front of me and stroke my chin and decide, well, I'm going to put them together in this combination this time. You know, I'm working out of the design dialogue myself, the conversation, Um, and out of my own experiences of play, and particularly what's driving me fictionally. I mean, Spiona was a brutally obvious example of that. I'm sorry, what? Spiona. I know exactly what the spy fiction, which as it turned out is intimately entwined with spy nonfiction, um... I learned exactly what its operative passions and ideological positions were. And when I quickly hit that weird intersection of fiction and nonfiction, reading spy fiction set in Berlin in the 60s, and then reading the autobiography of Misha Wolf, who was the spy master for the East Germans for so long, 
things clicked in my mind about what I felt was important to say. I was on a mission at that point. And that game is built for that mission. And so I found that the design conversation is one thing. The passions of the moment for what to imagine is another thing. And with both of those in effect, and with the kind of playful approach toward alpha that I talked about last time, mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot more you need. Just recognizing that you can, uh, you can arrive at one or another of these kind of micro mechanics, or maybe the larger, you know, diagrammatic picture, some of it, you can arrive at some point and say, okay, I'm going to hold that steady. And then we'll see what else becomes necessary, unnecessary, reinforcing or consequential in that context. Um, and it's, it, it varies all over the place. In one game, you know, it could be a very tiny detail that you had to keep. In some other game, it may be a much larger scale of what you want to happen at a very large level through multiple sessions and multiple consequences and then you just have to get small you know later um, so there's no automatic starting point and there's no huh, one word isn't in there you gotta you gotta have you gotta have this you can't have that you gotta have that except to say things like um, what I did with um, the the over engineering so that everything is codified and hard and laid down, um, and also avoiding that two track thinking of saying, well, as long as the things that are mechanics are handled as mechanics, and as long as the things that aren't are handled as dialogue, but they don't touch, um, don't fall into that trap either. Few other traps, you know, things like don't start publishing ahead of yourself, and things like I was talking about before, don't fixate on one particular game. Instead, be open to this kind of inspiration and scribbling striking whenever, and maintain a stable of things that are all kind of, you know, something you could see yourself working on. Hmm. Um, so I am, there are certain directives or explicit do's and don'ts that I have, but they aren't there in terms of an individual mechanic. I, I bet 